First of all, uh, Rui, we heard so much about digital and how we isolated with digital. Will technology also bring us closer to each other? I think that uh, we, I mean, in the past few years, I think we're all seeing a trend where, especially those of us who have children, may see them uh, less physically connected to one another with more experiences that allow them to stay at home. Uh, so I, I was a nerd child, so I did, I did uh, play a lot of computer games alone, but there are many opportunities to also just simply play outside, and those seem to be diminishing. I think that uh, we are very supportive of every movement that tries to connect people in the physical space as well. How? How technology would connect us together? I think in our, in speaking from the WeWork, uh, from the WeWork, our goal is quite literally to connect people within the physical space, and to that we employ a plethora of technologies that include constant analysis of how people behave within the physical space, understanding patterns of movement that show what makes people stay at one point for a long time, understanding social patterns of people who connect digitally but then meet physically, etc. So in our world it's actually an easy example, but I would challenge any technologist in the audience to think through those issues as well. I want to offer a different perspective. Um, not to disagree, just a different perspective. Um, disagree, I, we want some... Okay, I completely disagree. Um, <laughs> Uh, as There's a, a disagreement as, in the panel. As, as a child, I grew up in uh, three different countries. Uh, my parents traveled a lot. And um, living in uh, Japan, London, and uh, Israel. And now, looking at my children, uh, who have lived in one location for their entire life, in kind of a suburban place in Israel, uh, I can tell you that via technology, uh, they are much more aware, much more connected to the world than I ever was. They're much more knowledgeable, they're much more empathetic. I don't like hearing all these stories about how children today are just, you know, they'll be stuck in their VR world and forget about. I think these worlds will connect people in ways, and I think that the last example just shown about the connectivity between different people in the VR um, in that museum is just a great example of how technology actually brings people together opens their mind, shows them a different perspective, and it's not about disconnecting people. Effie, we speak so much about robotics and autonomous uh, smart machines and intelligence machines around us. Uh, the, last, the, the next buzzword is about emo emotional computing. It's kind of like machines getting aware to our emotions, seeing us and understanding how we behave. And actually, people project that the caregiving industry, or a lot of actually the empathic services that we get will get from robotics or from machines. We'll stop actually getting this affection from humans, we'll start getting it from machines. What do you think about it? Yeah, I, I don't believe that actually. I think that there's a balance ultimately between the human relationship and machine relationships. I think machines can make us smarter and I think they will and that's already proven true. But I think ultimately the human connection uh, is something important that kind of brings us together. I mean, for me, something I'm really excited about when I think about robotics, I think about AI, is the intel inside, right? Who's going to be who's going to become the intel inside for robotics? Um, so that's something we've been spending a lot of time on. We've made some some bets in the industry, but in terms of taking away the human connection, uh, you know, I don't see an environment when that happens completely. One, uh, I think you were pioneers in actually making people collaborate with each other and actually started with kind of like collaborations as a platform. What do you see? Are you optimistic in kind of like how we collaborate with each other or actually we are more separated from each other through technology? Much more collaborative. Thank you. Much more collaborative. I was actually at um, Travelers a few days ago up north, uh, the insurance company, and they were talking about how they're going to use video to promote what it is they want to do. And they have a connected workforce initiative where a lot of the millennials, mind you, now they're anywhere between 27 and, well, 17 and 37. So they're getting into a lot of the workforce, into executive positions of workforce. They're used to having these devices and they want to do more with them. So they're talking about how do you bring it integrated and highly connected into the workflows of sales, of marketing, of training, of learning. And they want to get that done in a much more um, immersive manner, in a much more collaborative, much more cooperative manner. I just want to say something about connection in terms of physical versus non-physical connection. So video conferencing, there was a research a while back and they asked how many people are going to, how do people like to connect? And 75% said face-to-face, 20% -face, said email, 5% said video. And then they were asked what do you think is going to happen 20 years from now? And 90% said video. The reasoning is, people are going to, if you look at the future of work, there's going to be 
dynamically forming teams that are distributed. They're going to be all over the place. And they're all going to be busy with their thoughts. But eventually, there's no replacement to the physical connection of trying to understand what the person wants. We've been doing this for millions of years, and people are going to want that. So we're going to talk maybe more about VR, AR, mixed reality. The concept of getting people together in kind of teleportation mode so that they could be connected and do things together is huge. And when you talk about robotics and IoT, there's going to be streaming devices all over the world that would be you know, creating these alternative universes so you could be streamed into them, you could be everywhere and anywhere. I think it's going to be more easy and more efficient and you could choose where you want to be. There's not going to be any more restriction of space. You could be anywhere or in an imaginary place, but wherever you will be, will be a highly engaging and a highly connected environment. People are going to want to connect. Although, do you think that ultimately, for Apple example, buying emotion, are they going to be able to assist us in reading your facial expressions with time? Because that could take away some of the human connection over time. I don't know that it takes away the human connection. I think several things are going to happen. It's not just about understanding your impression. I mean, we're, I was involved in a company that was actually with 3D cameras, basically taking the entire body and inserting it into a virtual and augmented and, and uh, mixed reality, which big companies, and by the way, one of them bought them, is looking to do. And the idea there is basically not just take to try to understand what you're thinking and what you're doing, but to actually put you there and see what you're doing and what you're thinking and have that as part of the uh, conversation. So I think that's what Mark uh, Zuckerberg thought when he had bought you know, into this space. And that's what people are thinking. And you don't necessarily need to be with your own body. You can replace other bodies. You can do a lot of fun things and exciting things. But you are going to want to connect. We're humans. You know, there was a while back, the bell reach out and touch somebody. They literally needed to explain to people that they want to use telephone, right? They needed to market telephone. And little did they know that everybody knew they wanted telephone. They didn't need to market it. Back, there was a movie, uh, What Women Want, which was kind of like a Hollywood star that knows exactly what women want because they can tell their thoughts and he starts actually reacting accordingly. Mm. People say it's not the future, it's actually going to come very soon. We believe that brain technology soon will be able to project through non intrusive means actually what you're thinking about. We'll be able to project, there's already some examples showing that kind of like what picture you have in mind. And how would look human-to-human -human connection when we actually don't have any veils anymore? We're fully transparent to each other. Technology can read our emotions. Technology can actually read whether we lie or not. And technology can also project our thoughts. What would be human interaction when brain technology would be a kind of like a mature technology? I mean, I think the first question is, are we really going to get there where it's as pervasive, right? People need to opt in. That's at number one. People need to want, actually, for this to be the reality, which um, I think there are stages. You know, for me, when I think about, um, you know, kind of the human brain, I think about the first use case for me is something like phobias. I think that there's a lot of way for us to use some of this technology, right, to help people through some of their phobias. In terms of understanding truly what a person wants on an individualistic level, um, you know, I think that uh, the human mind, as we all know, is incredibly complex, but it's not just the mind, it's the heart. And combining those, right, you need to essentially like map two different um, systems in our bodies that are collaborating. So, I, you know, for me, I don't know that I'm a, a believer actually in this happening. Maybe 50, 75, 100 years from now, but not in the near term. Okay, I'm a believer. <laughs> uh, I think we're living in a historic time where things change exponentially faster than our brain have been programmed to think things change in the last million years or however long we exist. And we think, uh, even in the terms that we are used to in the technology evolution, think uh, us as a panel in 1997 talking about computers, mobile wouldn't even be a word that we would use. What could we imagine? We would be very basic in our imagination of what the world would look like, and it's only been 20 years. And I think with the introduction of AR, uh, MR, and, and everything else, and uh, uh, processing power, and compute, and everything around it, the world, the connectivity, you know, uh, if anybody of you has have watched uh, Westworld, which seems completely futuristic, but really isn't. That was the point of the show. And therefore, human interaction may be robotic interaction, and we won't be able to distinguish. And for the people born, then it will be okay. It will be okay. Uh, now you know, your are WeWalk. Uh, there's a walk in this segment, but people actually project that it's the end of the walk generation, 
that actually the projection, if we have the autonomous vehicles, the projection will be that 25% uh, of the workforce will be actually losing their job because autonomous vehicles. Uh, unfortunately, even lawyers will be losing their jobs because of uh, a smart kind of like artificial intelligence that will be able to replace lawyers, accountants. Keep going. Doctors would be replaced by artificial intelligence. What's the future of work if so many of our positions would actually be taken by machines? Um, that's a very grim outlook. I mean, I don't know that I fully subscribe to it. And I, I think that in the past, uh, if you look 100 years back, there have been, ever since the you know, initials of the Industrial Revolution, but actually way before, there have been sort of those uh, you know, grim uh, prophecies of the, the death of the workplace. I think there are uh, different people have different points of view. I, I've, I've heard um, uh, Eric Schmidt speak a couple of years ago about uh, this being the age of entrepreneurialism. Because the one thing machine cannot do is take initiative over new things that need to be done. And so our belief, based on looking at the data of graduates coming out of universities, joining the workforce, people leaving large corporations, starting businesses, businesses that are churning and, and being recreated, is that there's definitely a very different, uh, th there's a very m big shift that causes different um, decision-making processes in how people choose their next job, where there's way less connection into, say, long-term financial stability and way s stronger connection to doing what you love and fulfilling right. yourself, etc. And we still see huge categories of work where we just do not see computers replacing human but, beings. You know, I think that uh, Professor Noah Harari was not too nice in his kind of like vision. He said, most people will be redundant by their skills. If the skill that you acquired in your lifetime would be driving, or your skill is about kind of like doing accounting, or your skill was around, I don't know, some kind of like cons consumer support, or even agriculture, we just don't need you anymore. Right. What? No, they will, ad they will adapt, you know. There's a couple of things about earlier conversation about this question. Lawyers are gonna lose their job and then they're gonna become moderators, so it's fine. <laughs> So you're Thank you, Calculus, for <laughs> <laughs> saving the job of a lawyer. You're gonna, uh, the, all the lawyers are going to arrange events. Um, so, but, you know, to your earlier point, by the way, you were asking about what's going to happen in a world where everybody says what they think. There's a beta site for that. It's called Israel. <laughs> and it's not doing that bad. So, uh, but back into your comment here. I, look, there was a time when people thought that New York City is not going to be able to have more people in it because the amount of, excuse me, shit that was in the roads because of the horses came to a certain maximum at a certain amount of capacity. And they said, there were not going to be able to be more than X people in Manhattan because it just is not going to be able to shovel everything out of the streets. Well, lo and behold, the cars came in. And the same, you know, about other stuff. So technology creates opportunities. It does not just to reduce opportunities okay. and, and changes the paradigm. Okay. There's going to be new things to do. There's going to be a lot more time to relax as well. Gil. Uh, I have a question for you. We spoke so far about how we'll connect with the environment. We spoke about how we connect to each other, what we're going to do. But there's one thing that is a big promise is how actually machines will become actually connected to us. And this machine, uh, connected machines, or the IoT that we call it, that will have be connecting with the machine. The machine will predict kind of like our needs. We'll learn more about them. For 20 years, we see demos of kind of like the smart refrigerator that will order for me, or the smart oven that will offer me what to cook, or the smart, I don't know, smart uh, house that will lit for me, kind of like the lights in the real time. But that takes a time. Do you think that actually this IoT uh, on the consumer level is about to finally materialize? Absolutely, it's materializing, and uh, it will materialize in a pretty short amount of time. Um, just a personal example, um, I have uh, 20 devices at home, connected devices at home. Less than half of them are actually mobile, mobile devices or computers. And the rest are connected devices, they're things. It could be my Alexa, it could be my door sensor, it could be my air conditioning sensor, it could be so, and, and other sensors I have. And we, uh, as a telecommunication company, we also work in embedding those in cities and in small, medium businesses. So the, the cost of IoT and, the, and the, the simplicity of doing IoT is something that uh, is getting lower and lower. And that allows mass market adoption. That is the role that I have decided that Bezik will follow in allowing these kind of technologies to be available for everyone. So you don't need to be a huge IT company and you can actually do it as an SMB or as a household. And around me, there's an entire ecosystem that's, built, that's being built and we are working with 
that allows that to happen. So for me, it's a very current sure. uh, trend. Effie, uh, if you are actually going to have omnipresent IoT devices and we're connecting with the IoT devices, there's a lot being talked about personalization and predictive technologies that actually predict what I want to do with these machines and actually recommend to me how to connect with these machines and how machines will be utilized. What do you see as the future of kind of like personalization of usage or predictive technologies that can actually predict our needs? So I absolutely agree with your comment. We're also uh, very bullish on this. I think a critical component actually to get at personalization is how we're taking this data from all these disparate systems and combining it and truly learning about the person. So for example, if I think right now about my online presence, between Amazon, Google, and Facebook, they probably know 99.9% .9 of what they need to know about my online persona. How are they connecting it to my offline presence when some of these other you know, device manufacturers and players don't want to share this data with them? So I think that's a critical point that is missing in the ecosystem today. Um, so I think once that problem is addressed, right, that they have a full picture of FE and what I want in my online and offline world, then we can get to true personalization. But until then, it's too disparate. But, you know, uh, Effie, I think you know that's the right time to ask the question. We've just seen uh, this weekend what happens when there's a cyber catastrophe across just our data. Yeah, which, exactly. But actually, when we have this kind of like vision of the IoT and the connected environment that we all connected to, all our information is actually available to these smart machines, yeah. that can be actually a privacy or cyber catastrophe. How do we actually protect against this? How we get protected? and how do we actually build an architecture which is protected by design? Yeah. That's right. Yeah, I think the weaponization of I IoT is huge. Uh, next thing you know, it's not just vehicles that become weapons, but it's refrigerators and doorbells and everything else that, that's automated. Um, so I think that's a core area of focus. But I think, again, it comes back to the disparate systems. It, it's impossible to protect something where the entities aren't talking to each other. Now, as consumers, are we going to feel comfortable with all of our data being accessed through one point? Well, some consumers actually for personalization, you'd be surprised how much data they're already giving uh, right to entities just in exchange for something like personalization. So cyber is a, a huge priority. Um, I think that there are many companies now, at least that we've seen, that are sprouting out just around IoT protection uh, and security. Gil, what do you see kind of like as you're offering actually to the consumers now this IoT full connectivity for the devices for the consumers? What do you see in terms of their appetite for security, privacy, do you see actually a need for new products that would make them feel comfortable with all these data they're sharing? Absolutely. It's the, it's the fundamental, we call it, it's like the Maslow of IoT. And the Maslow of IoT starts, the, the lower part of safety and security is the, is the cybersecurity part, right? So you will not reach the other levels without covering this one first. By chance, uh, this Monday, we actually launched a very promising, what we believe to be a very promising uh, cybersecurity and management uh, product to the consumer market um, called SmartNet, which actually protects immediately everything that goes into your house. So anything you connect in your house is immediately protected because we understood that we cannot just be the deliverer of innovation on the application side. On the service side, we also have to protect, and that's part of our responsibility, taking care of those two parts. Okay, uh, we spoke a lot about consumption and kind of like habits of consumption. Let's talk, uh, let's speak for a second about production. Uh, there was so much talked about uh, 3D printing and actually shifting from uh, mass production to targeted production or kind of like specific production. There was so much talked about additive manufacturing that actually we will be manufacturing just upon need and specific kind of like requirement. Uh, do you see the 3D market, which is now I think almost 15 years old, maturing to a time that we'll actually have this uh, targeted, personalized production and we'll keep actually living in a mass production environment? I will uh, uh, just seeing the trend of companies joining the WeWork community and I'll, I'll mention Israel specifically where we recently opened a building called Tazerem in the south of Tel Aviv that has an entire area dedicated for companies that base their entire business on 3D printing facilities. Those are too expensive for them, but they can use shared facilities within an entire building, and we're using it as a pilot to actually potentially roll it out in the rest of the world. So we, we are definitely seeing a new category of businesses that would like to manufacture hardware products instead of doing plastics, etc., through China with very lengthy and very expensive manufacturing, wanting to start 
to create their first 100,000 units to test the market. And I think it has taken time, it will take a little bit longer, but I do think that this is an infrastructural shift that allows the experimentation and minimum viable product type mindset, the lean methodology into hardware that was definitely missing before. So I'm, I'm very think, excited about You know, I, I was exposed to your project, I think, uh, with Tom, yes, with uh, Root in Israel, which I think is a very impressive project. But I want to understand whether you see it as a tool for companies or actually small businesses to show the uh, minimal viable product or just to demonstrate, I don't know, a demo of a product, or do you really see a shift in production towards uh, specific personalized production that, you know, now I decide I want uh, my shoe and that's actually the coloring or the uh, knitting of the shoes I need and it will be immediately printed and shifted to, uh, shipped to me. Do we see actually a change in production and consumption methods or will keep actually having the, the Amazons and the mass productions? I think we're on the way there. And I think it's going to take time, and I don't think any business can now create a direct-to-consumer shipping based on instantaneous order and full vertical integration, yada, yada, yada. But I do think that the landscape is gradually getting there, and I think that if, if you take an outlook of five, ten years from now, I do manage, ma imagine, sorry, entire categories of businesses where people can rely on infrastructure and platform that is not theirs to actually ship designs they've built through software that is then manufactured in those microwaves through shared facilities that are much cheaper. Uh, I'll say that, yeah, I think this is happening, but I think at the end there's just too much creation and consumption in this world. I think that through mixed reality, ironically enough, people will be able to create in 3D printing in a way, you're recreating everything around you, and when you have gloves, you can touch everything. If you need to interact with something, it's gonna exist, whether it's physically existing there or not. We're talking 20 years forward. I do wanna say about the distributed and the security, you know, I think one of the things you've, you've been asking and talking about is blockchain technology. But part of what's happening right now is that the infrastructure, in the case of Bitcoin and beyond, and we see that in the world of video, is there to enable distributed systems to be able to operate securely and well, and many are jumping into it. In my world, in the world of television, distributed systems is also television because now you're disintermediating the middleman, the MSOs, the cable operators. You don't need the infrastructure. There's already internet. So now it's about the dis individual content creators. You can think about each one of them as a little IoT. Um, you think it's an IoT for TV. And they're creating content and they're pushing the content. Blockchain enables that to be done in a secure way without IP issues, without DRM issues, to be able to do the deal, cut the deal, have the analytics, everything in a secured fashion through distributing something you know, with everybody. So I, we're I, getting there. You know, I think it's a very interesting observation and certainly very, uh, I think, interesting uh, vision of the future. But I want to remind you that 20 years back, when actually the internet just started to be, I think, more commercially usable, uh, people projected the end of intermediaries. We never thought about, why do I need an intermediary? I'll go direct to buy from the producer. Small local farms will be able to sell direct from their small farm. We thought that actually this need for intermediaries to just be a broker is gone. Technology will be able to connect us directly. If there's one thing we learned, that the internet recreated intermediaries which is just stronger than ever. Right. Amazon, 53% of actually product searches are done at Amazon. We understand that in the hotel industry, we've never seen uh, companies as strong as actually Priceline and others. And actually, intermediary is just getting stronger. Is it just about architecture? We had the internet architecture, which is distributed, and we actually created the stronger intermediaries. Are we going to use the new architecture for... The push, the rents are going low. So when you think about digital music and you have the five big ones, and then after that, if everybody said after Napster, you don't need any of them. Everybody's going to sell their stuff. And they're back into the apples and the same, you know, they're back. But the rents have gone down because it's a competitive environment and because now there's a stick and it has to be more democratized. And the amount of creators has significantly increased because the rents have gone down. So, look, it's like democracy. You need to have tools to actually manage democracy and make sure there is democracy. It's okay to have an intermediary as long as he's not a pig and as long as everybody can participate and you're democratizing the process, okay. that's fine. Since we spoke uh, now about blockchain and actually about distributed architecture, let's ask for a question. We know that blockchain is probably much better for distributed archive, distributed ledgers or for smart contracts, but we still don't see mass adaptation of blockchain protocols, even not in industries which you would assume would be the first to embrace blockchain. Why do you think there is a barrier in uh, adapting blockchain, and will we see any 
uh, I don't know, good use case for blockchain finally? Maybe um, from, from, from our perspective, telecommunication side, I think uh, there is absolutely an opportunity for, for this kind of technology. But you also have to understand that it uh, also uh, the people who drive the industry have to adapt to this new type of architecture and that they're not, you know, they're not uh, part of it as it evolved. So think of uh, IT managers of big companies deciding their next product development of, I don't know, their IoT infrastructure will have these blockchain uh, signatures. And so that threshold has to be passed. But I think definitely it's something that blockchain will gain speed and adoption because it just, this trust issue is a must to solve. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think we have to up. I think I, think I, I heard something. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. I think it's a rare opportunity to have such bright minds and actually innovators to talk a little bit about the future, to share some thoughts. So thank you. I hope we continue this conversation.